Hey, folks, it's your host, Julian. This week, I sit down with returning guest and living legend, Mr. Robert Alvarez. You guys have heard me talk a lot about Robert throughout this podcast. He's worked 55 years in the animation industry, and you would be hard-pressed to find a show that you liked growing up and his name not being attached to it in some form or fashion. I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Robert here is finishing up later this year his 55 years in animation. I can't imagine I'm going into year three of the same restaurant. Obviously, for animation, you guys bounce around to different places. Once you find a home like yourself, Hanna-Barbera Cartoon Network Studios, and you find a place that you really enjoy, the people you really enjoy working with, you kind of stay there. I can't imagine what it's like 55 years in one job, man. What are some what are some thoughts that come to mind when you sit back and think, man, I've been doing animation for 55 years of my life? Well, what's interesting about it is, um, you know, I was going through stuff today looking to find things to put up on my Facebook page. And, mm. and I posted it before, but I'm, I, I will probably within the next couple of days post my uh, copy of my first paycheck from 1968. Yeah. And and the, and the building where I started working in, which doesn't exist any longer, and fifty five years goes by, believe it or not, incredibly fast because it's like in a blink of an eye, it's I'm up to fifty five years, and um, I consider myself extremely lucky that I got in when I did, and uh, I've had a lot of good times working in in the industry. I've also had some times that weren't so pleasant because believe it or not, not everybody in animation is really nice. And um, I've had to deal with a lot of assholes and people that will lie to you and screw you out of money. But that was all part of basically growing up in the business. And I've had made, I've made the best part about the working all these years is not so much the shows I've worked on, but the people I've met along the way and become friends with, because I've worked with some of the most amazing, talented artists in the in the industry, and they're all far better than I ever could possibly be. And my attitude about it was, I'm always sitting in the room thinking like any given moment, they're gonna walk in the door and say, get the fuck out. And because they discovered me. And, uh, but I've had a, I've had a, a, a long run I've been very lucky. I've won some awards and uh, I've had a good time and I, I have no regrets about my, my career. Um, I, mean, I, I wish I was more talented. That would have been nice. I, I wish I was a better animator. That would have been even a, more of a plus. And um, I just, I'm, I'm just lucky and, I, and I'm grateful that I have the friends that I have and uh, some of which that you've interviewed on your show, mm -hmm. I still stay in contact, like Sean Cashman and Randy Myers and Paula Spence. I communicate with them by email fairly frequently. And um, I'm glad I made it this far. I, you know, I, I never imagined it would last this long. You know, w w you know, when you're young and you're 20 years old and you and you that first day you start out in animation, and this is back in 1968. You're not thinking about five, 10, 15, or 55 years down the road. You're just thinking about, I just want to keep going. I I hope I can work next year. You know, and it, that was the way I used to think about it, my career early on. I would always be concerned about the next year and the next year. And that, I didn't get over that for many, many years until finally, probably in the last 10, 15 years at Cartoon Network, I just got relaxed and I just thought, I'm not going to worry about it anymore, you know, and, and, most of that time I was under contract to them anyways. And um, so I, I finally relaxed after many, many years, but you know, not everybody's that way, but that's the way I am. Beautiful. And uh, like I said, this episode, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to jump all over the place here with uh, Robert's career, but there was something that he dropped that I didn't know about uh, right before we hit. And I said, we had to, we had to bring it back up once we hit record, man. But uh, we were talking about our, our childhood and, 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 you know, 
last year we lost Kevin Connery, the voice of Batman, right? So when I read my Batman <laughs> comics, that's the voice I hear Mark Hamill. That's the voice I hear is the Joker. It doesn't matter whether it's a live action movie. I'm reading a comic book. I'm looking at art. Those are the two voices that I hear in my head on a regular basis whenever I read my Batman comics. You just associate a piece of your childhood. And last year we lost him to cancer, sadly, you know, um, and I don't know how we got on that topic, but you said you'd worked on Batman, the animated series for that first year, man. What was that right. year like? Well, what happened was my friend, Tim Walker, who I've mentioned before, we've been friends since uh, meeting. I, we met each other in seventh grade and we both went to the same high school, art school, and have worked occasionally over the years. He's retired now. Uh, he was at Warner Bros. He was on staff at Warner Bros. working on, and he started freelancing on Batman. And, and in those days, this was pre-digital, so there were no animatics. And in the old days, we used to, when I, in the last interview, I, I've talked about this, we used to slug the board. Mm -hmm. And you would get the storyboard and the soundtrack, and, and they would give you line lengths to tell you how long each uh, line of dialogue was so that you could time stuff out to the frame on that. And he called me up because he couldn't do everything and he recommended me. And so I started picking up slugging and writing sheets on Batman. And usually you'd get an act and you would slug that act. And, and then you get once they went to track and the sheets would come back and you'd write the sheets on that. And I did it for almost the, uh, the entire first season. And then, then towards the end of the season, um, was nothing. It's like uh, I would occasionally call the production manager of the show and she basically was bullshit lying to me. Uh, and I soon discovered that. But she said, oh, you know, we're behind in scripts. And my advice to young people in animation today, if you ever hear that excuse that we're behind in scripts, it's a bullshit lie. It's, it's what it translated. It means uh, we don't have any work for you. We don't want to use you. Yeah. And um, so anyways, I called several times and then I stopped calling. And, but I still was freelancing. I was at Hanna-Barbera on staff, but I was freelancing on other Warner Brothers shows because I'd get called up by other shows. So one day I just, it was just like perfect timing. I was in the, the, the Warner Brothers building and I got to the elevator and this lady came to the elevator at the exact same time as I did. And I said to her, look, you know, I know you're going to tell me that you're behind the screen, but, you know, if anything comes up, let me know, uh, you know, I'm available. But because I, I, you know, I just felt like I might not give it a shot. She goes, oh, yeah, we're, we're behind in scripts. So I would go up to the floor I was going to, and I'm sitting in this other producer's office. And I can't remember what show it was. It, it, it could have been like Animaniacs or Tiny Toons or one of those shows waiting to get a, for her to give me a handout. And that other producer from Batman comes in with a package to a freelance person who I know and I've worked with in the past, off and on, like going back to the 70s, where so I knew who he was, a package to be delivered to him. And I'm thinking, like, what am I, a fucking idiot? I can see you're handing him work, which means you've got work, but you're just not getting it to me. So I figured, okay, fine. Something had happened, but I, I could not find out what it was. And several years went by and my friend, Tim, he knew, but he just, for whatever reason, didn't tell me. And one time when I was talking to him, he said, oh yeah, I should have told you. Here's all I know. There must've been a problem on a show that I did. Mm -hmm. And they never asked me to correct anything, correct it, fix it, change. And I never got any feedback from them on anything whatsoever. And all of a sudden I was persona non grata. And to give you an example of how lame that show was run, when I was still picking up, uh, the then production manager was Ann Lighting. Mm -hmm. And she goes, oh, uh, the director. The Warner Brothers was the ones that started giving the, the guys that were supervising storyboards the title of director, but they really didn't direct one frame of film. They, they didn't do animation direction. So she goes, yeah, Dick Sebast wants to talk to you about it. He's gonna hand, up, hand you the board. So I go into his office. And he hands me an act and, you know, the storyboard was maybe like that thick. And he goes, I think this should be around uh, 500 feet. I said, oh, you, you rough timed it? And he goes, no, I just think it should be about 500 feet. So I looked at, I didn't say anything and I just figured, oh God, what an idiot. So I went 
back with her with her to her office. I said, that guy's an idiot. I mean, what did he come to that conclusion by weighing it? Mm. How do you, how do you how do you know a sh- an act should be five hundred feet when you when you haven't t- rough timed it or anything? That was the only feedback I ever got. So they never told me what I obviously did wrong. Yeah. Fast forward several, uh, well, around 1998 or 99, Hanna Barbera, the property had been sold because Turner had mer- merged with Time Warner, mm-hmm. and they moved us to Sherman Oaks. So we're now in the same. I'm in the same building with Warner Brothers. You know, I'm working for Hanna Barbera. And I'm working on Cow and Chicken. And then I worked on Powerpuff while I was there. So one day the producer of Cow and Chicken comes up and he goes, hey, you know, they're looking for people to do freelance on Batman Beyond or something, whatever the hell this show was. And he, are you interested? And they go, yeah, I'd love to work on it, but they won't use me. He goes, what do you mean they won't use it? Goes, Trust me, they won't use me. So he went and asked the studio, Warner Brothers studio production manager. And uh, his last name, his name is Schwartz. I can't remember his first name. He said, he tells my producer, oh yeah, I meant anyone but Robert. That pissed me off. So I called him up because I'm not working for Warner Bros. I'm working for Hanna-Barbera, even though we're in the same building. And I read him the riot act. I said, son of a bitch. This, and I told him what happened and he never gave me a pick. I don't know what the hell's going on here. I don't appreciate it. I just was really pissed off. And he said to me, well, do you want me to go talk to Bruce Tim? I go, no, what's that going to do? He's, he's going to change or it's a fuck Bruce Tim. So uh, I never found out exactly what was wrong. And, uh, you know, so be it. It's not like my career came to a crashing end. It's just like that was the way they were running the, that show. And they were not exactly honest, which is boys and girls happens all the time in animation. And um, that's what I had to deal with. And so, like, I don't have a, a good, any good feelings towards Bruce Tim. And um, I used to always see him outside the building when we were in Sherman Oaks and be sitting down looking at a storyboard or a script or something and smoking up, you know, tons of cigarettes. And he would never smile at you. Mm -hmm. You you could pass him and, you know, make eye contact. And he would just like, you know, it's like, fuck you. And so uh, I don't have any good feelings towards him. And I did like working on the shows that I got to work on for Batman because I thought it was a great looking show and the storyboards were really good. And I would I would have loved to have done more, but um, it's a mystery beyond it's a it's a mystery that defies explanation. Mm-hmm. And I and I I've told you everything I know about it. And if you ever interview somebody else that was there at the time, maybe they could tell you something, the reasons why, but I really don't know. I'll have to write that down. I haven't had too many people. I think Alan Burnett is the only person I've had on for Batman. Um, I've been trying to get Dan Reeve on for a little while. Uh, it's just we can't make our schedules sync up. Um, and there's a few other people that I've got out there in the wings that we're working on. So maybe we might be able to track down the story. I've got it written down here. Um, but nonetheless, man, so we talked about some not so glamorous <laughs> stuff. Let's talk about some really good stuff, man. So you had brought up two shows in particular, Cow and Chicken and Powerpuff Girls. Now, mm-hmm. obviously, we just passed. I think it was last week. These couple, these last couple weeks are just running together, so I'm I'm spacing on which week it is. But we just passed the What a Cartoon, uh, the the original premiere uh, from '95, um, just a few days ago, man. Uh, and one of those shorts that I had, I'd put in a video, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't watched this, the What a Cartoon anniversary video we did on the YouTube channel, so go check it out. Um, it was. Uh, like a little bit of a retrospective is our first retrospective video. Um, obviously we did the five shorts that made it, but there was three shorts in there in particular that I had mentioned that, uh, kind of defined what a cartoon for me and yours just happened to be in there with pizza boy, no tip. Now there was a person that asked, uh, specifically about pizza boy and we'll get to that question as we get down the road man um but i don't think we talked too much about it the last time you were on your short one of the shorts you got to do uh when you were on so i would love to know from start to finish how this one came about and then we can kind of dovetail into a few other periods of your uh, of your career man but where were you at when you thought up the idea of pizza boy no tip well a little backtrack i had already been working on some of the shorts because you know a lot of those shorts were being done by young artists coming in and they've never done anything like that and they certainly didn't know how to didn't know anything about directing Mm -hmm. and i had at that point i probably had at least 25 between 25 and 30 years in the business i can't remember um we'd have to do the math but um so 
um, I got assigned to like direct their 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 shows, and a lot of them were not so good. And early on, especially the people that pitched early, got green light and got to do their their shorts. And I think it was because they, were, I think, whatever Cartoon Network of Cyber and Lazo and whoever made decisions were trying to find their way, and they were green lighting stuff that I think they would not have green lit in a year down the road. Yeah. So I'm working on a lot of these stuff and I'm going, you know, this is not funny. This is not that good. And I, I actually thought to this myself, I, I thought I can do something as shitty as this. <laughs> and um, so I, I don't know. I was doing some sketches, I think, in my office at Hanna-Barbera. And I drew this drawing of Pizza Boy and I just labeled it Pizza Boy. I just drew, I, I wrote on the piece of paper, Pizza Boy. And then I started thinking about well, what can you do with this? And I came up with the idea of him having to deliver the pizzas to the Arctic Circle in five minutes or less, and he'll get a big tip. And I thought that it was just, I would think of gags and I would do my drawings, some, not always the same size. Sometimes they'd be like small, sometimes big, whatever. And I had these big bulletin type boards that along the, the perimeter of my office, I would just pin them up and I could switch around any anything I wanted to. So I finally got what I thought was, you know, a start, a middle and an end and all that. And then I put it down onto a storyboard and I pitched it. I, you know, I got an appointment for one of the pitch days and went in and pitched it. And surprisingly enough, I got a green light so, and they let me do it. And from there, I mean, that was the tough part, coming up with the concept and pitching it, because after you pitch it and they say, OK, it's easy, mm -hmm. you just do it. And um, I got to do it and I had to deal with some, you know, some bullshit after that with yeah. um, one of the development people. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Ellen Cockrell. That name sounds familiar, but I don't know too much about her. Oh, what a loser. Fred Cyber decided he's going to like... Uh, assign a development person with each person that's got a short that's been greenlit. Mm -hmm. So my my short is already greenlit. What the hell do I need her for? She was just like, you know, extra baggage that we don't need. You know, it's like throw her overboard. Who needs her? So uh, I, had, she, I had a meeting in her, in her office. And you've seen the short. Mm -hmm. It's not complicated. I was sitting next to her. Literally, she was like maybe this close to me and we're both looking that way and sitting in her office. And I pitched the short telling her verbally the, the whole short from start to finish, gag after gag after gag. Got to the end and she said to me, what's his motivation? <laughs> and I went, yeah. I thought to myself, yeah, I thought to myself, oh God. I really, this is what really went through my head. I kind of looked at her like this and I thought, I bet if I reach around the other side of her head and wiggle my fingers, I'll be able to see through from this <laughs> side. That's what I, that's what ran through my head. And then I started talking to her like she's in, you know, the fourth grade. And I went, well, if he delivers these pizzas to the Arctic Circle in five minutes or less, he's going to get a big tip. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and that's, that's some of the things you had to deal with at that time. And, you know, it was just, you know, I, I, I did my short and that was the end of her. And um, and it was fun. And I, I used some of my friends to do layouts on it. But Andy Biok did some layouts on it. Craig Kelman did layouts. And Mark Kalser did layouts. And I did layouts. And the layouts that we were doing were, were practically animating the whole thing. It was just, yeah. it was just a thing for, the, those, the, a lot of those shorts got, uh, produced or, or done over in, at the uh, Hanna-Barbera studio in, in the Philippines, in Manila. And so it was just basically a thing of them cleaning up your 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 layouts and following the charts and doing all the in-betweens and all that stuff. And we would send BG keys so that they would paint the keys properly and all that. And, but everything was laid out. Every scene had a layout to it. It was, it was the old-fashioned way of doing a cartoon short. And that's how we did Pete's Boy, and it was a lot of fun, and I had a good time on it. What are some of the uh, – you got any cool – you know, 
obviously as we've as i've progressed <clears throat> excuse me as i've progressed going into my third year yeah this is three years of doing this podcast i've learned a lot from not only talking with you through these last couple of years but every guest i've had on a damn near learned something new about the art form uh, of animation um what was the idea? Was everything from all of those shorts sent over to the Philippines to get animated, or was there multiple studios that would animate? Uh, I think uh, probably the majority of them got done in, in, at Phil Cartoons in Manila. And okay. uh, now there would be some exceptions to the rule. Like, um, I can see his face, but I can't think of his name. He's he's now in Arizona, but he was, uh, he did Fritz the Cat. I can't think of his name. Uh, and, I'll look it uh, up. He did Lord of the Rings, Fritz the Cat, and hey, um, I, I can't. And he made a lot of features. Robert Crumb. He did. No, no, no. Animator. He uh, he had started out at Terry Tunes way back when, and I just his his name escapes me right now. And he, your audience is probably screaming his name as we speak. Oh, Ralph ba uh, Bakshi. R Ralph Bakshi. Yeah. Oh, he me, he got he did he was contracted to do I think three shorts but he got into big verbal arguments with buzz potemkin who was like one of the producers supervising producers there and they, he only did one mm -hmm. so but his stuff was done somewhere back east and then there was a guy in italy that did one or two shorts and so they were done in italy but the majority of them were were done in manila and uh with the except like but there's our exceptions like um david feast his his cow and chicken he did everything himself and it was all done here and they probably sent it out i don't know where he sent it to, for ink and paint and camera maybe it did go to the philippines for that but he animated everything layouts and all that all it was like a one-man show but yeah the majority of them were done in manila and they did they did excellent work now did when you guys did a short would you get to pick where it would go or was it just by production schedule that's where it would go uh i don't I don't think you got to pick where it went in those days it's mm -hmm. different nowadays like artists that are doing shows sometimes will suggest a place yeah. that they'd like to send it to but it all gets down to money and the deals that they could be that could be made but in that and at that time no it was like i think you know you didn't get to choose where it was going to go but if you were experienced and knew what you were doing you you're you're controlling the look of the sh of the show, and if you're not experienced and you don't know what you're doing, I don't think that really happened. There, like there was some like there was one short that was done in in I think it was done in New York, and the reason why it got done and I can't think of the guy's it was something was to it do with Curse the Cowardly Dog. No, not, not well. His probably got done in New York too, but yeah, no, John not, it, uh, it was another one that I I can't remember it was something to do in a zoo or something i can't remember and person I, I i did some some work on that a little bit of work on it and the only reason it got done was because it was friend of fred yeah you know it, it really wasn't that good it's just like you could say the same thing about the shorts that the two shorts that uh, bill hannah did and the two shorts that joe barbera did they were like throwback stuff that came, looked like they came out of the vault from the 1970s mm -hmm. they, they weren't funny but they, you know, who's going to say no to those guys? Yeah. And, um, but yeah, the majority of the stuff was done in the Philippines, but not everything. Now, looking back, obviously, it's a long time ago. It's 95. So we're 28 years uh, from that initial What a Cartoon initiative. Um, do you have any that stick out to you that we'll keep those, obviously, the big five that came out of those, the Dexter, the Powerpuff, the Cowan Chickens, the Johnny Bravos, and the Kurds, the Cowardly Dogs. Those are probably the most five notable ones that came out and actually went to series. But are there any in that that group of that initial 48 that you remember that stick out to you? Oh, yeah. Uh, buy one, get one free. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that? You can find it on YouTube, I'm sure. That was done by, oh, uh, God three um charlie bean uh and two other guys. i can't remember the other guys that worked on it and they, they had they had previously worked at ren stempy and they were there now because they came with with the, the rest of the guys from cal arts uh but buy one get one Don free Shank. oh chris chris riccardi charlie bean 
and then the Kerry third guy Yost came, and Kerry Yost, Kerry Yost. And Ron Shank or uh, what's listed. Yeah, those guys, all great artists. And uh, I did a little bit of work on that, and that looked good, and it was funny, and would have been great as a as a series. Mm -hmm. it was, you know, it's basically, the, it's two. The, the main characters are two cats. One's a real hip cat, and the other one is like a real frightened, scaredy cat all the time. Yeah. But what happens in the short is really, really good, and it's so well done and really looks good. That would have been good as a series. But you, you know, several I don't know it was maybe a week ago. You and I exchanged some messages on Facebook mm -hmm. and about and I told you, look, nobody knows what's going to be a hit. Yeah, and and executives are all you know they all puff out their chests and pat themselves on the back about some hit show that became a hit show under their regime and they didn't necessarily pick the show but they never talk about their failures about something that they put on that was you know died yeah and and it's like i said a hit show is an accident waiting to happen no one knows if, if, if people could pick hit shows all the time they'd be super wealthy and they'd be running some studio somewhere and they're everything they did would be a hit show but that doesn't happen it just doesn't happen absolutely um and i'll have to go back and watch that one because that one i went back when i was doing <clears throat> when i was doing that retrospective video i went back and i watched all of them but there was a lot of there was a lot of edibles involved so and it was very a lot of late nights too so there's a lot of them i just don't remember because i don't remember it was dark when i came in here it was light when i left and it kept going and flip-flopping so uh, it was a, it was a rough couple of days trying to get that one put together. But uh, one of the ones that stuck out that I didn't mention in the video that I wish I would have, ladies and gentlemen, if we ever get to a second part, man, I, I want to break down each each one of those initial forty eight shorts and have one episode per. Um, but uh, oh, rats and rat in a hot tin can. You remember that one? I think oh rats. Was, I think oh rats was a, done by a guy from um, Indianapolis. Yeah, I know it was. I know it was directed by John McClanahan, I believe. No, that was Two Cats Fat uh, Shit. Or is it the Old Rats one was. Uh, um, I, I vaguely remember the the character design. Yeah, I wasn't really impressed with it. It was. Uh... Now here's here's something else to remember. You know, I have a lot of opinions. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily going to be agreeable to a lot of your viewers. Someone someone out there is going to go like, "Wow, I thought." And then fill in the blank of whatever short or something was the best thing ever. And I might yeah. say, that yeah, was a piece of shit. It wasn't <laughs> funny and it wasn't that good. But that's, you know, hey, in Hollywood, opinions are like assholes. Everyone's got one. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I've got my opinions. But I, the old rats one, it, uh, apparently a lot of other people agreed with me because it didn't go anywhere. Yeah. It, it it just, you know, and there were other shorts that were done. I, I, a good amount of those shorts were not really all that good. And it was just, the timing was like where they were trying to discover things and they were trying to find what could be hits. And they fortunately did get about five sh series out of what was there. And that's pretty good considering the amount of shorts they did. It really is, man. I mean, it was 48, uh, you know, and there was quite a few that when I've had Fred on a, quite a few times and he said there was quite a few we should have, uh, we probably should have went back and revisited and stuff like that. But hindsight and that armchair quarterback is a little bit difficult to, uh, a little difficult to work with when you're working in the moment, man. Um, what a time to be alive during that. What a cartoon phase. I mean, like I said, that phase for me, I introduced to cartoons through what a cartoon obviously everybody's pretty much got the mickey mouses that they know when they're really little the disney movies the looney tunes of course are they're epervescent they're always in everybody's subconscious consciously and everything like that you, you wake up and you know bugs bunny and daffy duck you know all these characters you know the roadrunner you know wiley coyote and all these guys you know so it wasn't really until what a cartoon and what would eventually become the cartoon cartoon era that I really start just falling in love with animation as a little kid, man. I mean, there was something special about that spinning dial and the splat of the what uh, cartoon and that each one it was different with somebody else's voice, man. Uh, so like I said, hats off to you guys for doing that. Now, one thing I know we didn't talk about last time, uh, you know, we've talked a lot of Gandhi. We've talked a lot of Craig. You know, I think we've talked uh, a, a little bit about, you know, some of the other shows you worked on, man. Uh, but throughout your entire your entire tenure at Cartoon Network, 
Hanna Barbera. You obviously start with Hanna Barbera, and then you rotate into Cartoon Network Studios. Man, uh, was there a time period that you found the most enjoyable compared to all the other time periods? It's relative to the time, but I, I would say probably a couple. Um, when I was at Hanna Barbera and I went on staff, but like for instance, when I was animating on the Smurfs, mm -hmm. I liked it. You know, you may think of this the Smurfs as a lame show and your your viewers might think well that it wasn't very good and it's not the greatest animation at all but I enjoyed working on the Smurfs because it was easy to do and I was animating and that was fun and um and then directing at Hanna-Barbera on several different shows I like doing that like I not that SWAT Cats is a great show or Capital Critters but I enjoyed the fact that I was directing those shows and uh, and then other other shows that I was working with the producer of those shows that those two series was David Stoy and I worked with him fairly for a long good time at at Anna Barbera. But then when we got to um, Burbank and Cartoon Network opened up, we they had already started. We'd already been doing we'd already done Cow and Chicken by then, which I thought was great. I think it's a really terrific show. And but they'd already done Johnny Bravo, Powerpuff, and Dexter's. But when we got into uh, Burbank at Cartoon Network, when that opened up, we were doing more Dexter's eventually, and and Powerpuff and Samurai Jack. And I think that's that period was probably the best period of all because of the it, the it just my luck that I got to work on these great shows. Mm -hmm. And um, but you know. If I look back over my career and if you went down my list on IMDb and said, what about this show? And I might say, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And that was that was fun. And that was good. But, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of times in animation for me when it was just like, you know, I, I just was trying to keep a, my head above water and keep working and hoping that I was going to be working again the next year. And and I've told this to a lot of people over the years that. You don't always work on something you like. Mm -hmm. It's the, the thing is just to keep working. If you only worked on shows that you like, you're going to be very poor because <laughs> not everything you work on is great. You know, it's, it's sometimes you do work on shows and I've done plenty of them that are just lame, but it's like, it's what's in front of you. It's what's handed to you. It's what's offered and there's nothing else going on. But I know some people that are really selective as to what they work on and that's good for them but that's my attitude used to be uh i would say yes to anything mm -hmm. just to keep working and making money and especially when it came to freelance i would always say unless i was so small i would say yes to it just so i would get more money coming in and believe me i worked on a lot of shows while i would like on staff at Hanna barbera freelance for other studios that were terrible yeah you just you just do it because it's, it's the way to survive. Absolutely, um, and there was one thing that I can't believe I completely just blanked over while looking at your resume, and you brought it up, man. It was SWAT cats. Um, now with SWAT cats, I've I've heard this, and you know it came up with Fred, and Fred's uh, you know it's he's been on record saying that both Two Stupid Dogs and SWAT cats were just absolute failures at the studio man and then when he went to ted turner he's like i need 10 million more dollars i got this idea for 48 shorts we're going to go back to a looney tune style-esque format um where it's three seven minute episodes superstitious bumpers everything in between and we're going to push this initiative where we're going 48 straight weeks of a new show each week now i I don't see where he was coming from as far as just the success of those two shows, because I, I think it's a lot like the, the, the opinions, man, because where financially it might have not have been a success or, you know, maybe some people just didn't get, it. I absolutely love those two shows, you know, two stupid dogs and SWAT cats. I've said this on numerous occasions. I think it's when I, I talked to Charlie not too long ago. 
um, I told him when SWAT cats would come on, like me and my younger, my younger brother and I were like almost two years apart. I think there's like 18 months between us. So if you've got a younger brother, ladies and gentlemen, if you got a younger sister, it's, it's like warfare growing up. Everybody's trying to outdo each other. But when SWAT cats came on, when we were younger, a ceasefire was initiated. Nobody did shit for 30 minutes. We sat down in front of that TV together and we watched it. And then probably as soon as the show ended, the credits started rolling, we would start beating the shit out of each other again. Man, it's just what brothers did when they were younger. Um, but uh, I don't get to talk too much SWAT cats, man, when it comes up. But when it does, I like to talk about it, especially with the show coming back around here pretty soon. I mean, the uh, I can't remember the brothers' names. They're sitting right there. Right. Tremblay, Tremblay, thank you. I know Christian, and I can't remember the other one. Um, but they got a uh, second chance to bring back SWAT cats, man. I'm I'm pumped for this one. Um, but what are some of your memories from working on SWAT cats? We haven't had to, like I said, we haven't had too much SWAT cat talk on here. My only memory, because that was a long time ago. Uh, my only really memories of that were the people I worked with. Davis mm. Doy was the producer. Bob Honorado, who's since passed away, was uh, I don't know what his title was, but I know he did. He might have been doing storyboards and, and been in charge of design. And the three of us, a lot of time, would have meetings in Davis's office and go over the storyboard and whatever and, and, and talk about the show. And that was an enjoyable time for me. I, I, you know, looking back now, I don't, if I see like any clips on YouTube or something, I don't particularly think the show's that, that great. Yeah. But uh, it was good at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I liked working on it at the time because I think. I was directing the shows and I was working with people that I liked and it was, it was good. And, um, I had a, I had a good time working with, with, uh, those particular people on that show. Now, were you direct? Do you remember if you were directing or did you get to do any kind of animating on there? No, I did not animate on that show. And, um, I was just doing the old fashioned directing, which would have been slugging boards and writing the exposure sheets. Mm -hmm. and um i'm trying to think of the last time i actually animated anything and it was probably sometime in the 90s uh and i can't recall what it was oh it was probably my shorts yeah because after i did my shorts i don't think i you know i don't think i did any more animation after that again and uh it just became directing was the thing that i was doing all the time <laughs> If you don't mind, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I think I, uh, whatever, whatever's going around, I think I got, man, I've been real congested lately. So it might be all the pollen too. I'm not really allergic to trees too much, but you go outside, it's yellow all over the driveway, all over the cars. It's everywhere, man. Um, but, uh, what was, what was that decision like for, for animating? I mean, did you not want to animate anymore and you just wanted to just do nothing? Well, directing? Swat Cats was not animated here. No, Swat okay. Cats was done at once. I think Swat Cats may have either been done in the Cuckoo's Nest in Taiwan mm -hmm. or Korea. I don't or I don't remember where it was animated. So he, it was not a choice because eventually what was happening over the years, you know, basically started in the 70s when Hanna-Barbera started shipping work to other countries to work. And then the contracts changed. It got to the point where they didn't have to guarantee any animation being done 2D in LA so it, you know that was it wasn't like you you could say like well I'm going to animate I want to animate on the show and I you know it was not up to me and and in a way I'm glad I didn't because I don't think I could have handled that stuff you know yeah. with the, the jet the you know the jets and and the, the characters I, I think I would have been really bad at it and I'm glad I you know it would have been a real struggle so I'm glad I didn't have to but uh you, it was no there was no option there it was getting shipped out it was like it's like what shows are done now you know in the digital world it's like pre-production and post yeah man it, it's kind of a bummer because like i said looking at animation on the outside looking just being a fan right i think i think you were actually one of the first people on that you you kind of broke it down and uh, we had many talks before, but, you know, I, and I've said this many times, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize, but it's like when I first started doing this podcast, I assumed if Robert Alvarez is there, 
you know, we'll just use you as an example since you're on the show. Like you're doing everything from painting to drawing to storyboarding to writing. I, I figured, you know, one person they did, it was a jack of all trades type of thing. I didn't realize that there was a different person for each avenue of the animation process. You know, so like I said, these last three years has been eye opening because it's fascinating to see how just like a hundred years ago, we're doing all of this stuff in house. You know, you had a few outliers where they were shipping it off. You know, when you read the Moose, the Roars, the uh, Jay Ward Productions book, you find out like all of that original uh, first couple seasons was all done in Mexico. That's why it it looked the way it looked. And and Jay had said that, you know, he hated it. The animation style was just not what he wanted. It was it wasn't until George of the Jungle came and they did all of the animation in L.A. And he's like, that's what I was proud of right there was just how beautiful that was. And it was also so expensive here. And then I think about that as like there's some charm to that really rough animation for that, you know, that really early Rocky and Bullwinkle. And one thing I think I know we've talked about was, uh, you know, your your love for 101 Dalmatians. I think I told you, you know, when Cooper first started watching Cooper's the the, the youngest one at this point, um, you know, uh, when he first started like noticing movies, it was it was the dogs. It was 101 Dalmatians when he started. And since then, it's kind of it's kind of progressed through the Walt Disney catalog when it comes to the animated movies. Now we're on Lilo and stitch and, and Canto and Moana. Um, <laughs> but going back and watching 101 Dalmatians, there's something special about seeing when lucky goes to turn his head, you see the real roughs that are underneath that. You see the pencil lines, you see the etching, you see the yeah. dust that was caught on all the cells, you know? So it, it's, it's been fascinating seeing, you know, how it started, you know, a hundred plus years ago, whatever it was to where it's at now, where it's being all digital. Um, when the digital started coming into the industry and you started picking up on it, man, what were some of the initial thoughts about it? Did you think it stay around? Well, uh, first off, I'll tell you like digital work started coming in early as digital ink and paint, replacing the old, you know, ink and paint departments. Mm -hmm. Hanna Barbera had this monstrosity of a a computer that almost looked like a miniature sub. It was just huge. Yeah. And it was for ink and paint. And, you know, now everything is a lot smaller. And and they, the first, I worked on the first Hanna-Barbera show that used it. And it was that Gary Coleman show where he's an angel. Yeah. Terrible show. Yes. Because they didn't, they weren't, they weren't able to work out all the technical problems. So sometimes when you saw the broadcast, like you would see things like glitches or, double image or something like that but that was a digital ink and paint show and nowadays everything is digital ink and paint and you know you, you can't tell the difference but that was the first experience and then the digital world as far as um what's the way it's done now with you know they can you can have a, as many layers as you want because it doesn't really matter and it's digital ink and paint and the, you know the digital camera all that stuff uh, i don't remember exactly when that came into where everybody is doing it but uh like for example when we did the the first like well samurai jack was like in 2002 i think 2001 that, is when, when it aired but you guys started working on it but believe yeah I, I that was originally i i don't know I, that might have been a digital ink and paint at that mm -hmm. point but it was still hand drawn and everything and probably shot on film you know maybe and then a few years later everything was like digital with the exception of like the drawings because like, unless the show is CG, it's still being hand drawn by somebody. Or if it's a flash show, then it's not. But if it's a, a regular show and it's a 2D show, there's somebody over somewhere in some country drawing that stuff. And then the, the fact with the digital world is you can do a lot of stuff that you could never do when, like, when I started. For example, when I started in the business, you could only have, I think, like the maximum of five or six levels to be shot because it was on cells. Mm -hmm. And if you have too many levels, it grays down and changes the color of the bottom level. So you can only have so many levels. And nowadays, you can have, a, it could be a million levels in a scene because it doesn't matter because it's all digital as far as the the way it's composited and, and, the, and the painting done. That it's not technically painting, but it's color, ink, digital color. And there's so much more that they can do now that they couldn't do when I started. But someone is still drawing the stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Now, do you think it's it's and I don't want to say easier in a bad way, but do you think it's a little bit easier this way than it was when you started or is it a little bit more difficult because of all the programs you got to run through and all the technology and shit like that? You know, I don't know. I think to me it was probably easier in the in in the <laughs> in the dinosaur age when I started because you know, everything was hand drawn and yeah, there was all studios had ink and paint departments or they freelanced out ink and paint because there were there used to be ink and paint services in town mm -hmm. that would do commercials and do work for certain places because they didn't have their own big ink and paint departments and it would be cheaper for them to send it to a service. And um, nowadays they got to draw everything and then they have to, they have to go through all the steps that were done when I started. I mean, they have to check everything. They have a final checking and, they have to shoot everything. They have to, you know, uh, do the ink, the ink and paint, which is digital and all that. And then they have to composite everything and send it back. So it, it might be slightly more complicated, but you know, it's. I'm sure it's not that all that difficult for the studios because they've been doing it for quite some time now, and it's just a different process. Right, man. Uh, like I said, it, it's. I'm glad it's still around and. Uh... Before we rotate into into some of the cool stuff I've got lined up, as well as some of the fans' questions, man, I wanted to get your uh, get your honest opinion on uh, kind of like the state of animation right now. Where do you you've been through, you know, a couple different mergers with a couple different companies? You've seen studios come, you've seen studios go, you've seen creators come and creators go. Um, you know, with the with the guy on on the uh, on his way out, you know, getting ready to enjoy retirement. Where do you see the state of animation right now? Do you think this is something that uh, that is effervescent? It's going to be here forever, or do you think it's well? It's going down? Yeah, animation is never going to go away. But here's my opinion of the current state of of the animation industry. It's not. I don't think it's in a particularly good place, and I'll tell you the reason why. Streaming, for one, has kind of changed everything, and not, and in my opinion, not for the better. Mm -hmm. Streaming has almost changed the industry back to kind of the way it was when I started. When I started in the business, a season usually was six months, unless you're like some important person that's that worked all year long, and you were laid off, and then you hoped that you would get be hired or get to work again the following season, which would start maybe in like April or something and go to November or something like that. Streaming has kind of done it, that again because... In streaming, a season doesn't even have to be 13 half hours. Mm -hmm. It could be 10 or 6. It, and they may not even go past the first season. They may not go past two seasons. And a lot of times they don't go past three. And um, so like someone working on, a, let's say, a Netflix show, they may work for a year or two if they're lucky. And then they're out looking for the next gig. There's no guarantee that they're going to get hired on until another show at Netflix because it's not like the old days where you would see the people in the studio, because a lot of people are working remote and you'd be in the studio and, and you could go talk to somebody and go like, hey, I'm going to be winding down on my show. Or the producer would say, hey, Robert's going to be done with our show and can you use them you know, on your show? It doesn't work that way any longer. So for the young artists, I think it's really, it's kind of sad because anyone's only got like maybe five years in the business, they have no idea what it used to be like. Mm -hmm. They don't know what like the golden age was like. And um, so they have struggles. And I think streaming is part of the the process. And, uh, you know, Netflix started out to be like, supposedly like, you know, well, welcome to the, uh, to the, uh, I'm trying to think of the, um, I would say Neverland or, or the uh, Enchanted Garden. I'll say it's great. It's not that great anymore. I mean, they're, they're dumping shows left and right and people. And look what's happened to Cartoon Network. It's a dead studio. It's dying. It, in, in a year from now, Cartoon Network, in my opinion, probably will not exist. It'll be a name on a, on a, on a ledger just like Hanna-Barbera is. And it's just not the, it's not the same as it was even five years ago. The industry is changing. Now, <clears throat> maybe in five years, I was recently talking to Craig McCracken and he was telling me like a lot of studios, Netflix being one, 
They want to do existing properties as opposed to doing something new. Mm -hmm. Maybe in five years, the studios will or networks will want to do new materials. So right now, the industry is kind of going through a, a stagnant state, in my opinion. Um, I have no idea what's going to happen next. And, and I actually, at this point, my, I don't really care because it's yeah. not going to affect me. Um, it's, I, if I could, look, if I could predict what's going to happen, I'd be like those so-called geniuses, executives, development people in a, you know, and I would be, I, I'd have like some big executive job somewhere, but no one knows, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen next. And it's just not a really good time. And you mentioned it before. I, I've seen a lot of studios come and go, and I can name studios that I work for that don't exist any longer. Yeah. Uh, Ruby Spears, Filmation, MGM, because MGM started up again at, at something in the in the in the nineties. Um, Hanna Barbera, TMS. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Well, Cartoon Network soon to be on that list. Yeah, Deke and is no longer around, I don't think, either. Because I, I did work for Deke. They're all gone. Why did that happen? Because studios get <clears throat> bought by corporations, and then corporations change, and then they decide they don't want to have that, you know. It's like but when Ruby Spears got bought out by something, and then that whoever owned them sold them out to the company that owned Hanna-Barbera, and so basically they got closed down. But that's what happens. And so studios come and go and streaming is going to change things, not necessarily for the better, in my opinion. And that'll change too over the next several years, but time will tell. Yeah. Like I said, it's uh kind of a pessimistic way to end it. However, it's kind of what we're going through now. You know, it's, you know, when I had Fred on not too long ago, man, I, I told him the little story about going up to Washington and I was in a national park and, you look at the binoculars and then half of the forest that was up there was just burnt down. It was like lightning struck. It was super dry. Everything burnt the ground. And I'm sitting next to there and there's a tour guide over there. There's uh, one of the national park rangers is there. She's like, look into the binoculars. So I'm looking around. She's like, what do you see? I was like, I see a lot of green on the ground near, near where all the black burnt stuff is. And she's like, well, that's new growth. 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. You know, she kept going on and on and on. She's like, there's going to be new growth. It's going to be the trees are going to go cry, are you know, going to grow higher. Uh, there's going to be more vegetation. There's going to be more animals here, you know. So hopefully that's kind of what's happening in animation right now. You know, there was a lot of stuff that was started up, you know, prior to and especially during the pandemic when the pandemic first kicked off. And then it just it's trying to write itself now, I think, is what Fred was saying. It, it, it was going so far to one side. It's trying to ballast. It's trying to come back to the middle. Um, you know, it sucks. There's a lot of people that are out of jobs and out of out of work, you know, but hopefully something good does come from all of the all of the bad that's really happening through animation right now. Um, you know, a lot of people seem to be a little bit optimistic about it. And like I said, I just hope we see great animation again soon. I got a feeling we will. So there, there's always going to be something new and yeah. someone's going to come along and, you know, there'll, there'll be some new hit show mm -hmm. and then other people will try to copy that and you know it's it's that's been the way animation tv animation has been for years and um it's not going to die there'll always be animation around yeah uh you know you're you know 20 years from now i i seriously doubt i'll still be on the planet but 20 I years from now, you you will be able to look and see like maybe reflect back on these conversations you had with different people from the industry and you'll be able to see what has happened over the 20 years. Some of it's going to be good. Some of it's not going to be so good, but it'll, it'll still be there. It's always going to be there because ultimately corporations now that own the networks and all that stuff, they can make money on animation, especially if they get into something that they can merchandise, mm -hmm. they can make money on shows and it's cheaper than live action so they're always going to do it but there may be like a drop off in the amount of production i i have no idea i don't know what's going to happen well stay tuned ladies and gentlemen now to get to some really cool stuff now nice. when i knew i was going to have you on first before we get to the really cool stuff man robert i, I think we got to do this more often i think two years ago was when the last time i had you on here yeah 
Yeah, roughly two years ago. That's way too goddamn long, man. I'm gonna have you back on here again. The next time, I uh, figure what we can do is we can throw uh throw a little throw a little uh, vote out there for the fans, and we'll pick a time period. We'll pick a few different shows, and then we'll know way ahead in advance the next time you come on and what shows and you know, everything that uh, everybody wants to hear us talk about. And then uh, we'll we'll just dedicate a show to that man because there's one thing i've really enjoyed over these last couple of years getting to getting to talk with you man because uh you want like i said at the beginning of the show you're one of those guys that i can reach out to that obviously ladies and gentlemen you made it this far you know robert here straight shooter he's not gonna he's not gonna beat around the bush he's gonna tell you how he feels he's gonna tell you how you see it and uh, there's something about that i think that is what's the word i don't want to say he's so american because it's not that i mean it's an american trait for sure but it's like it's it's something that's missing in today's day and age man it's just when somebody can just shoot straight with you cut the fat and just tell you how it is and how they feel man there's something special about those type of people and you got to keep those people in your lives ladies and gentlemen but uh like i said we gotta have you back on here sooner than uh we did this last time but so I had a few people I reached out to a few people that not only have I had on, but people that saw that you were coming on and wrote into me. And then when they wrote into me, I was like, hey, I would like you to write something in for Robert. So we've got a couple people here that I'm going to read off to. Uh, and the first one, uh, he said, he, you might remember him as Paul Steck. Do you remember a Paul Steck? Yeah, Paul Steck. Yeah. Yeah. So he wrote in and because he saw my post and he was like, uh, he, so he, he read this or he wrote this, excuse me. Unless you were there, it's hard to understand how instrumental Robert was and what he did. He's an icon and a true OG. His influence on the industry is much bigger than even his massive list of credits on some of the most seminal shows ever produced. As an art director, it was always a joy working on episodes with Robert. He was a true artist's artist, always open to ideas, and excited to take the work to the highest level possible. After leaving Cartoon Network, I would drive by on occasion to roam the floors to see who was still there. Robert's office was always on my list to find and poke my head into. That playful, devious, warm smile and genuine joy in seeing an old face from the heyday would be everything. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez, for making what we did that much more awesome. Three cheers for Robert. Hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray, and hip, hip, hooray. That was from Paul Steck. Yeah. R Rob Renzetti I, wrote in. I got, I got along. I, I just want to say I got along really well with Paul. Yeah. And, um, to me, he was always nice mm -hmm. and uh, talented artist, and um, he's very kind to say those nice words. Yeah, man. Thanks for thanks for writing in, Paul. So we got another guy that wrote in here, Rob Renzetti. And this is one thing, yeah. like I said, I, how's that? No, I'm laughing because I, I can almost imagine what Rob's going to say because uh, at, at my on January 20th, they had like a Zoom mm -hmm. retirement type party for me at and. Tons of people showed up and got the invites. People that weren't no longer working at Cartoon, and Renzetti was one. Yeah. And Renzetti, a lot of times, can talk like me. You know, like mm -hmm. he doesn't censor his words. And uh, so I can almost imagine what he's going to say. Oh, he was very nice in here. He, he, I, I think I don't, I don't want to say he censored anything, but he was very, he was very nice in here. And uh, this, this is by far one of my favorite ones that wrote in. Um, and he's such a cool dude, man. And he also had, like I said, when I, when I talked about those shorts in that last video, yours, no, uh, pizza boy, no tip made it, but me and the count made it as well. Right. That show yeah. in particular, I didn't know. And I, I think we might've had this talk. I didn't know what UPA was until cartoon network, which is sad when you think about it, when you're a little kid and you don't have the internet, you don't have books, you don't know any of this shit and you're just trying to learn mm -hmm. it out. Everybody starts from a, from a, from a unfamiliar standpoint when you're learning anything. You know, so it was really this show that kind of led me like, wow, that looks really cool. And then seeing other shows when I stayed up late at night, I was like, that looks really familiar. And then I would see the UPA logo or when I started doing the stuff that I'm doing now and I'm really digging deep into to all these all these guys and gals that have worked in the animation field and knowing that a lot of this stuff was because of the UPA guys, man. So it, it's just a fascinating time. But Rob had this to say. When my crew of know-it-all, know-nothings arrived at Hanna-Barbera, Robert Alvarez welcomed us with open arms. Robert actually did know it all, and he was generous enough to show us how things were really done. We were enthralled by Alvarez's tales of days gone by and delighted by his sarcastic sense of humor. We grabbed on tight to this legendary man and refused to let him go. All of us have benefited from his talent and bathed in the glow of his larger-than-life personality ever since. Rob Renzetti. He's very kind. I, I, I would just tell you something about UPA. When I was like 12 and 13, mm -hmm. I used to ride my bike a lot of times with my friend Tim to UPA because yeah. it was still there. And one of my one of the things and I 
you've seen me post a lot of stuff mm -hmm. from UPA and because I would we always went first thing we do is check the trash cans to see yeah. what it was about and take whatever we could find but one of the nice things I like to do and I would go up to their they had a big glass door the front door of the studio and uh Tim and I would go up to the door and just look in and stare at all the matted cells up on the wall mm -hmm. and to this day I don't know why we didn't open the door and come in and say can we just look and yeah. what, the worst thing they would have said was no get out so we, we never went in but uh UPA was like a one of my favorite places to go to just to see what we could find and you know we'd try to look in the windows and see if we could see anything it was a great studio unfortunately the building that was bought after it was sold by Roy Disney Jr. Mm. And most people don't know this, but that building was designed by the architect John Lautner, who was yeah. a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. And he did some amazing houses that are still in existence in LA and all that. And he designed that that studio. And that's why it was different and nice looking. And thank you, Roy Disney Jr. He tore it down and put up a, a modern building on, on, the, on the property. So yeah. that, that building no longer exists. Days gone by, man. It's uh, that other than Cartoon Network Studios, uh, you know, that that studio in particular, and I'm working on a UPA project. I'll talk to you about it after because uh, I haven't mentioned it too much. But uh, <clears throat> that 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 studio in particular, I mean, it's just like I think David Stephen Cohen said it best to get the head writer for Curse the Cowardly Dog. When uh, did you ever watch that show? I got to imagine you did being at Cartoon Network. Well, you know what? I don't watch everything. And to be honest with you, I was not a fan of that show. I've yeah. seen it, enough of it to to realize I wasn't a fan of the show. Yeah. And uh, but, I, you know, I'm familiar with it. But the uh, he, he when I had him on, he he said that he dreams in those colors like courage was a very specific color pattern. And a lot of the shows that were done during this era, you know, Rob's show in particular, Robert Renzetti, um, the colors were so just so vibrant it was upa it was so when when he said that he would dream in the cur colors of courage that's what i think of when i think of upa i dream in in those shapes those colors i mean one of my favorite cartoons from that studio was uh was it jay walker the jay walker yeah i think that's what it was i just remember as a little kid seeing that and then just seeing the tail lights go by and then the, the lights would change colors and then the headlights would come by and it was just such a visually stimulating show. And that's what I remember the most about UPA was there was just something, obviously, I mean, you, 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 you know, the studio better than I do, but there's something vibrant about them. There was something different about them, the way the colors would come out of the lines. It didn't look neat going back to that whole 101 Dalmatians where you could see the rough animation where somebody drew a little bit too hard with that pencil. You could see it under the cells. It was, it was something about that, knowing that a man or a woman's hand was touching that cell there was something special about that and i, I can't really articulate it more than that uh, i mean it was just that studio was so fucking special um I, I will tell you two things that to remember about upa one it you know they did a lot of great cartoons in the in, you know during the late 40s and 50s mm -hmm. you know before they got into the 60s where everything was you know far more limited lesser budgets but there's one cartoon you can find it on YouTube. It's called Unicorn in the Garden. Yeah. And it, that, that is an amazing cartoon. Look at the design, the color, the way they, the, the, the layouts are done in that. It's absolutely beautiful. And uh, the man who directed it was Bill Hertz, who eventually mm -hmm. then went on to many years of working and directing for Jay Ward. And I had him as a teacher in 1967 at Chenard. And that was the first time I got to see Unicorn in the Garden because he brought it to... Uh, to class and showed it to us. The other thing I would tell you is uh, many of your people that are watching this may not know this or some of them I'm sure I have, but what Fritz Freeling said about UPA, he said, when I die, I want to go to UPA. <laughs> you got any cool Bill Hurt stories? Bill Hertz was a really nice man. Mm -hmm. He would bring uh, stuff that he had worked on to show us. He even had a, his the class over to his house one night. In, uh, he lived in this house in the valley, and he was just really, really nice. And later, after I was out of school and working, I worked on the the uh, film that TMS did, Little Nemo in Slumberland. Mm -hmm. And Bill Hertz was the supervising director on it, and I got to work with him again because I did some sequence directing on it. And I can remember going back to his 
house to pick up work on a Sunday afternoon or something like that. And I was, he had like a little studio in, behind the garage in his backyard. And I remember sitting in his little studio while he was in the house doing something. I was just looking around, lifting up things to see if I could find anything interesting. And he just was a real pleasant man. And to show you, I read an article once. I, I don't know how I found out this, but he got arrested with his grandson for doing graffiti. <laughs> and, and, and that's Bill Hurst. I mean, he was, a, he was a, a, a talented artist, really great to work with. And he was a great teacher. Oh, that's really cool. Thanks for sharing that, man. Um, I can't wait. I'm just going to say it now. So we're working on a, we're working on a multi-part episode series, I guess me and another guy that uh, does a podcast called the animation destination, uh, Brandon. And um, we're, this will be the first one we do. We've we're being very, what's the word ambitious. That's the word, Robert, super ambitious with this. So we've picked three uh, studios that we're going to do. The first one, obviously we're going to do J uh, not J Ward, excuse me, UPA. The next one being J Ward. And then the third one being Fleischer when we get to it. Now, obviously we're going to, I'm trying to start shooting. Uh, I've got a few books I'm reading through now about UPA and then that whole era for the strike and everything that led up to it. And then just trying to get as much surface and then subsurface information on that entire climate that was going on when UPA was formed. Um, so a lot of irons in the fire right now with that one. But uh, we're, we're hoping to have something out later this year on UPA. It's going to take some time because we've got a few people that are coming around from authors to to fans to family members of some of the UPA guys. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're working on. I can't wait to dig deeper. I'm going to see if I can't find that uh, that that arrest that arrest paper for old Bill Hurts and maybe we can work that into the. Yeah. You know, I don't know. There also is a, a, a I'm going to see if I can reach over and have it here. I have a book. That is a. Um, yeah, I got it right here. I don't know if you can buy this anymore, but Amid, Amid who does uh, Cartoon Brew, did yes. this. You have this book? Uh, I've He sent that to me on, um, you can get it. Oh, shit. What's it called? It's it's, well, it's a .org it's, site because that's like a $600 book now. This? So, uh, either this, that one or um, I don't it's know, modern, it's too no, modern cartoons or cartoon. Oh, yeah, that's that different. one is an but, expensive book. Yeah. If you have this, then you can you can when you do your podcast, you could probably edit in some of the photographs on this book because you know you can see what the studio looked like and um, you know just various pictures of people working at the studio. It UPA used to be there's a, a really famous restaurant that's right across the street from Warner Brothers mm -hmm. called the Smokehouse, and it's still there. And in between the smokehouse and UPA was a parking lot. So UPA was like right there near Warner Brothers. And um, that book, you might be able to use some photographs from that book. Uh, okay. I've got your, that if, you, if you're going to edit in pictures and stuff. Yeah, we're going to we're going to kind of do it um, like we'll do long format with a lot of the guests and then we're going to take pieces and then we're going to work off of like a timeline like guest. So it'll be from the beginning of the strike and how that kind of happened. And then we're going to, you know, announce the players and everything like that. It's in the real early stages of, of how we're going to do it. We're going to record everything and then pick and choose and put plug and play different people into different things and just work our way through the entire history of UPA. Um, another one, another great one, if you haven't read about it or if you haven't gotten it up uh, is when Magoo flew. Have you read that one by Adam Abrams? I, you know, I think I have that. And I'm trying to, what, I, don't, I don't remember what the cover, I think I have it. I can't remember. I believe it's just uh, Magoo on it. It's a, it's a black book. Uh, I got to pull it. I think I have that book. Um, but you know, yeah. The unfortunate, uh, the unfortunate thing about UPA is like, I don't think there's anybody alive anymore that worked there. There's, there's a couple people this, I don't know if you can see it, uh, but it's. Yeah, it's I'm pretty, cool. I've got that book. I'm pretty yeah. sure I do. It's fantastic. I, I can't wait to talk to him. He's going to come on at a later time. Um, the guy that wrote that one, he, and it's pretty much the definitive book for that entire era from start to finish. Um, 
So yeah, this this one, like I said, it's a super ambitious project and I'm really looking forward to it. And we're going to treat it kind of like what we did with the retrospective videos where we're cutting in some some video. And then we've got a couple people like uh, Emily Ubley, um, you know, obviously John Ubley's daughter, um, and yeah. then a few other, a few other folks that we've got lined up that are going to come in and then they're going to give us like not so much the the work stories of their dad, but what what they were like, you know, outside, you know, just humanizing these titans that are were in were in the industry. You know what I mean? So, all right. Have you so, uh, ever contacted Daryl Van Sitters? Uh, I'm I'm actually he's one of the guys too uh, that have been brought up. Uh, we just can't seem to make our every time we almost get our schedules lined up, it just it something happens. So we're in talks. It's just I have not lined up anything for him yet. Yeah, because he's got that, you know, the the making of, he did the book, The Making of Magoo's Christmas Carol, and he's very knowledgeable of UPA. Yeah. And uh, if you get a hold of him, he'd be a good guy to talk to. Yeah, we've uh, we've exchanged pleasantries and stuff like that on Facebook. Uh, like I said, it's just some of these guys, and with my work schedule, my work schedule goes from 12 to 14 hour days just by the flip of a hat. So it's trying to have just enough energy to come home and just hang out with the kids and wife at this point has been damn near impossible, um, let alone trying to do a little bit extra. But yeah, he's, he's on our list as, as one of our experts that's going to come on and just break down a specific point in time where we can just really not nitpick in a bad way, but just like pick out little, little things here and there. And like I said, just progress that timeline, but he's definitely on our list. Uh, he was actually mentioned um, by quite a few people too. As soon as we started talking UPA, I got a list of people that I needed to get on. Um, and he was at the top of almost everybody's list. So the, uh, the next guy that wrote in that we got here, man, was Greg Eagles. I'm pretty sure you remember old Greg, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, he said it was a highlight of my career working with Robert Alvarez and having him flawlessly direct the first animated project that I created and produced teapot. I will always remember how generous he was with his time when I would seek advice. I wish him all the best. And that was from uh, old Greg Eagles, man. He's a very nice man. He really was, man. And he's uh, definitely, you know, for me, it's like there's certain things that you just associate. Like when we talked about at the beginning of this episode, Kevin Conroy is always Batman to me and Mark Hamill will always be the Joker. Where They see Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker, Joker for me, hands down. Or Skips in the regular show. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's, man, that guy's a legend for sure. But uh so another guy that wrote in, but oh, let me finish that train of thought, man. So whenever I do leave this earth, man, I really hope I'm drifted off by Greg Eagles as the Grim Reaper because I think it'd make it yeah. all work at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, so yeah. we got another. Well, I, I have this feeling that when I drop off the planet, the first thing I'm going to hear is, come here, Sparky. <laughs> and then the, uh, whoever's on the other side is going to rip me a new one. Oh, man, I think you'll be all right, man. I, I really hope, uh, like I said, it, I it's i don't know about you man this, we're gonna get deep here for just a second robert i don't know about you but it's i'll be 34 in august right and i don't know what it is i don't know if it's just i'm having uh you know another we got another kid on the way and i'm pretty sure you've seen uh, we got a little girl on the way in, in april and i don't know what it is just over the last probably year i've thought about more about dying than i've ever <laughs> thought in my life you know it's not so much dying it's just the fact that i'm not going to be here for the kids anymore you know what i mean that's normal. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you get older cuz like uh I think about, you know, stuff like that a lot. As I've gotten older, you think about it more and I've got friends that I've talked to occasionally and it's the same, you know, it's the same conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're all mortal yeah. and we all have end dates, we just don't know when that's going to hit and um yeah, stuff happens and um it, here's what's true of everybody. Mm -hmm. these honest people that will admit to it when you're in your 20s and your 30s i was like this and and maybe you were like this in your 20s you never imagine getting older yeah you're 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 invincible mm -hmm. nothing can harm you you think you're going to look and feel the way you do at that point the rest of your life then one day all of a sudden many years go by because time goes by incredibly fast and you're getting ready to go to work something in the morning, you're staring into the mirror. And, and for me, it's like, son of a bitch, when did that happen? And time goes by incredibly fast. And we all go through that same thing. When we're young, we think it's going to last forever and we're invincible and, and nothing can go wrong. And then you get older and you start thinking about your mortality. And especially when you get into like my age, you know, 
and we talked about my health issue back in December, stuff starts happening to your body and you go, oh, great, what next? And then something next does happen. And uh, to me, the last couple of months have not been all that great for me. So I, I would, you know, would go like, oh, son of a bitch, what's going to happen now? Locust boils, water's going to turn red. What the hell's going on here? And for you to start worrying about it in your 30s is a bit too soon. Yeah. Well, so uh... I would say take a pill and relax and uh, <laughs> don't worry about it. Start thinking maybe like that when you're in your late 50s or si early 60s. But, I'll you know, just relax. I'll see what I can do, man. It's all these sappy movies I've been watching uh, with fucking parents and kids and stuff like that. I think that's what it is. Yeah, you'll be uh, fine. Absolutely, man. Uh, so uh, so a guy we got here that uh, he, he he probably had and the guy we're talking about. I won't allude to it anymore, but Fred Cyber wrote him. Um, <laughs> he had my favorite story like i've heard so many stories about robert alvarez right from all of the people that i've had on that have had interaction with you he's probably got my favorite before he name drops you man he's just sitting there talking about he's like this guy we we when he first met you know we bumped heads and then he was like there was an article read uh the article being written and then he said he just remembers you looking back he's like you want me to tell you you want me to tell this guy the truth you want me to lie to him to getting to talk to you and then getting to hear other stories about people's perspectives about their first meeting. I mean, like I said, he, his initial story on the, the meet, the mythos, the legend that is Robert Alvarez was, was, like I said, hands down one of my favorites, but this is what he had to say. Robert Alvarez is one of the greats, a silent, hardworking cartoon, dedicated, great. From the time he was a young boy, sneaking animation drawings out of the Hanna-Barbera trash bins up through the second golden age of cartoons, of the past 25 years. Robert has been dedicated to make good cartoons better, very good cartoons even better, and great cartoons as great as they were intended to be. It's been one of the honors of my time in animation to have worked with Robert. He made me better too, just like he did with every piece of film he ever touched. And that was Fred Seibert, man. You know, you know what I like about Fred when I worked with him? Um, I, I, at first, I, I was like standoffish to him, and, and, I, and I don't recall giving him a hard time but i'm sure if he said that i must have yeah <laughs> because one of, one of my many faults is that and you've you kind of seen it over the interviews i tend to say what's on my mind and um i think that comes from my mom because mm. my mom was spanish basque and she was like an old sheriff in the west she, she would shoot first and ask questions later she was you know hit you up the side of your head yeah and so I, you know, I was like that. But one of the things I did like very much about Fred was you could say anything to him and he wouldn't be offended. Mm -hmm. So I got really comfortable around him when there were times like with just one on one, no one else is around. And I could say exactly what was on my mind. And, and if I was complaining about somebody or something, he'd listen. Mm -hmm. And he one of his great traits is the fact that he's a good listener. He doesn't have to, he doesn't necessarily have to agree with you, but he will listen to your point of view and try to see what you're, you know, the way you're coming at something. And I really appreciated that about him. And the other thing is he came in and changed everything. What Fred did to the industry is now an industry norm. And he's the one that started it with the 48 shorts. Mm -hmm. No one else was doing that. He came in and then what happens? He goes to Nickelodeon and they do it, uh, you know, and then, uh, other places start doing it. And now that's the norm, doing pilots. Before he came in, writers were king and they were turning out the same crap year after year after year. And you couldn't tell them anything because you know they didn't listen to the artist. But Fred changed everything and he changed it for the better. And uh, I just consider myself lucky that I was a Hanna-Barbera when Turner bought it. And Fred came in and ran it because he he just completely flipped everything over and made the industry great. Absolutely, man. Uh, and this one is actually from your buddy that you mentioned just a little bit earlier. Uh, old Sean Cashman, man. Uh, he's got a little bit of a long one. So buckle up, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. It's a really good one, too. Uh, when I got to Cartoon Network, I had spent the better part of my career in TV animation on The Simpsons and King of the Hill. Half hour animated situation comedies. Uh, that had timing sensibilities on both ends of the spectrum. Although although there were times when the writer produ uh, producers would tell us we were going to a little too cartoony in animation, The Simpsons too cartoony. 
Anyways, at Cartoon Network, I had the good fortune of landing on The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy as a director and eventually supervising producer. That show opened up the floodgates to a whole new approach to timing, timing that I personally favored, but up to then had not had not had the opportunity to do. My adjustment from prime time timing to cable TV timing was a little tough at first. Thankfully, Robert regularly freelanced as a director on the show, aside from all of the other hard work he did on uh, other shows at the studio. He was very kind and generous in giving me a copy of one of his slug storyboards from the Pro uh, Powerpuff Girls, as well as a section of X sheets from an episode he directed. I have to tell you, for me, it was an epiphany. It was exactly what I needed. A whole new and different approach to timing animation opened up to, uh, for me from the point forward. And I kept the storyboard and pile of X sheets close to me from then on and to this day. What I learned from Robert was, uh, has stayed with me, and I apply it to my work to this very day. Thanks, Robert, for your help and guidance and for being my friend. It's from Sean Cashman. Sean is a great guy, and uh, he's one of those guys that actually stays in contact with me almost on a weekly basis to see how I'm doing. Because yeah. no, he, he knows what I've been through in the last several months and all that. And, he, and then we also would complain to each other about where we're working and the problems of work and all that stuff. And it's a great way for him to unload and a great way for me to unload. And I consider Sean to be one of my best friends in animation and, or, or just good friend because uh, he actually cares. And um, we used to, when we were before the pandemic and I was still working in at the studio and he was already at Disney at this time, we used to meet like about once a month at, uh, and go to the, have breakfast in uh, this little kind of like small little restaurant, cafe restaurant that was a block away from Cartoon Network. And it was always great because sometimes we would be joined by Brian Cheesley or Russell Calabrese when he was still living out here in California. You know, and it was like four veteran guys that would could bitch about the industry yeah. and talk about stuff. And it was always fun. And uh, to this day, Sean and I still exchange emails and he'll tell me about stuff that he's dealing with I mean, even in his personal life i mean and, and and i'll do the same with him and um i always try to throw a little humor into mine so that it's yeah. not always morbid but you know like <laughs> uh i have the tendency to look at everything with a sense of humor even you know i'll give you an example when my father passed away in 2002 uh we had a funeral and all that and um, at, at, after the funeral mass and all that, my brother and I were like the two guys in front that were gonna like carry the casket or something. And then there was like four other guys in there. And we got them out of the casket out of the hearse because now we've gone to the to the area in the cemetery where we're gonna put them. And I, I did not pick the, the, the plot. My sister had gone and picked the plot. And I looked up like this and I could see like these high tension wires that were running across the cemetery. And I turned to my brother and I said, hey, do you think that's gonna give him cancer? You know, <laughs> my dad's dead. But I find, I can find humor in almost anything. Yeah. And that's what's good about Sean because, you know, even when we're talking about serious stuff, I always try to throw something in that's humorous. And I really appreciate Sean because he's, he's such a really, really nice, man and uh i'm glad that he came to cartoon network and i got to know him yeah it was uh one of the highlights is just getting to talk to him and he's actually coming back on the show here soon because we're working on a, a king of the hill project um and uh so we got some fans questions here uh actually no i got one more um paula wrote in too i got one oh, more here. great and thanks for setting that one up, man. She was so fun. I think we went for like two, two hours plus to almost two and a half hours, whatever it was. She just a, an really, amazing just, artist. Absolutely. Um, and just getting to hear just her whole, I think what we, what we talked about, cause it was a few weeks back. I think all we really talked about was a, uh, you know, regular show and everything like that. And just little stories here and there. Um, you know, so she's going to come back on as well. And we're going to talk, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into a few of a uh, few other time periods in her career. But man, she was such a nice person, so kind with her stories and time. Um, but here's what she had to say. Robert Alvarez and I got to know each other during the first season of Regular Show. I was a little older than most uh, of the other on the Regular Show crew, and as an art director, I often consulted with Robert. 
our supervising animation director about story elements and how to handle difficult or unusual scenes. Those work conversations often turn into long talks about any subject under the sun. And one day Robert said something to the effect of, you know, uh, you know how this is. You're an old timer. I don't think he realizes it, but that was one of the nicest, most gratifying and most confidence boosting things anyone has ever said to me. I knew I had arrived. Robert is one of the most respected colleague, one of my most respected colleagues, but I'm very happy to also consider him one of my most cherished friends in the animation world. I've been missing him in our long conversations since working together at Cartoon Network, but I look forward to many more long talks in the future. And that was by Paula Spence, man. So she had some of the nicest things to say about you. The nice thing about Paula was her her office was all kind of like on the opposite. We were on the third, yeah, the third floor when we were doing regular show at for most of the regular show it started out on the first floor uh a lot of times especially the, she would get in early just like i would and a lot of times i would just go over to her room just so i could sit and bitch about stuff yeah and we we would you know pretty much would complain about the same stuff the problems and issues that were on regular show and um she's not as old as i am you know i when i said old timer because like she was had more years in the industry than yeah. almost everybody else other than me on regular show because most of those people were all very young mm -hmm. and she could complain about the problems she had with the show and i could complain about the problems i had with the show which were pretty numerous because um my, my biggest problem with the show was the storyboards because uh a, a lot of the talent on the storyboard artists were young and um they just made mistakes that because they were young and mm -hmm. uh, and i would go and complain and i would and i would you know like like hold up something like a story by go like look at this piece of shit what am i <laughs> supposed to do with that you know and then we would talk about it or something like that and it was always fun and then usually yeah. after about an hour of us visiting with each other other people start wandering into work and then i would just go back to my room and just keep working so I, I like Paula a lot. And occasionally we do Zoom meetings on a on a weekend just mm -hmm. to you know keep in touch. Yeah. She's great. She absolutely is, man. Uh one of the one of the favorite people that I've gotten to chat with. All right. So we're gonna get into the fans' questions. And I, I can't remember. Do you know if we ever because I don't I don't even think I had maybe I don't I might have had the sign off with you for the first time or I might have been one of the first episodes. I can't remember. Um, but do you know if we did a Mount Rushmore the last time we talked? I've seen you do that with other people, but I don't know if we did it. I don't think so either. So we're going to do those two questions, and then we'll rotate into the fans' questions. Sure. So you get a Mount Rushmore. You get, and I probably should have told you this beforehand, but I completely forgot because I could have swore we did one. But I, I'm now that you're saying it, okay. I know we didn't do one. So you get a Mount Rushmore, and then you get an honorable mention. So who's on your four for your Mount Rushmore, and who's your honorable mention? You know that's hard because yeah. I got to think, and uh, there are a lot of people I admire, and it's some of which your audience probably won't even know. Uh, well, one guy would be Ed Love. Mm -hmm. Ed Love was an an anime that he started at Disney like in 1932, and I worked with him in the 70s and a little bit in the 80s, and he was a really nice man. He used to live just a few blocks away from me and um he was a great animator and i liked him a lot my old boss at hanna barbera for a while ray patterson who was an animator who did a lot of work on the tom and jerry's and mgm great animator and so much fun to talk to because he would tell me old stories about working at mgm and you know bill and joe and all that stuff um If I had, you know, if I had to keep thinking, well, you know, probably who should be up on there is Milt Call, only because he was such a great animator. I don't, I never met him. I don't, you know, so I only know what I've read, but he's, he's a great animator. And, uh, oh God, you know, that's, it's really, it's really tough to think of who else to put up on that. I, I wouldn't put up anybody that's, um, modern or you know existing around now because they get enough stuff said about them and mm -hmm. uh, enough awards and and things like that but i'm thinking more of the vintage guys and um 
I, I don't know. I can't think of a fourth person I would put up on Rushmore. And uh, that's that's a good one. And uh, well, they can split half of the head. They can put Frank and Ollie. There you go, man. Um, so, and the other one that we always ask is the book recommendations. Is there two books that you have or that you've read or you've seen throughout your career that you think every fan of animation or anybody working in an animation field should have on their shelves? Well, I think if you're a fan of animation and especially if you're a fan of like early television animation, you should have the moose that roared. Yes. Cause that tells you so much about Jay Ward's productions from start to finish. That's, and it's not an expensive book. It's a you can paperback book and it's really inexpensive. Uh, that's one. And um, one of my favorite books, even though it's it's not you know it's not in print anymore, but and they're very expensive to buy if you can find one, is the Disney Art of Animation book. Yes, that was done in 1959, I think, when they were doing Sleeping Beauty to promote that film and all that. The reason why I like that, it's not it's by far you know doesn't even compare to like things that came later. I like it for nostalgic reasons because. My mother had a friend that worked at Disney Studio. She was secretary to of iWorks. And she got me that book. And when I got that book, I just used to look at that book, you know, page after page after page, you know, continuously all the time, staring at the drawings and the photographs. And the very last photograph in the book is a photograph of Eric Larson and Walt Disney in the hallway in the animation building. And Eric's leaning on the uh, on the, the one of the walls, I think. And Walt's kind of looking, I don't know if he's looking at him or something. And I found a copy of that on eBay and I bought it and had it framed. It used to be in my office. Uh, so I like that book, but it's it, it's not by far the, one of the best animation books, but for me, it's nostalgic. There, yeah. are, there are tons of, you know, I, I like the animation books that are historical and tell you history as opposed to like, well, this is how you do a walk. Uh, gives a shit about that you can learn that anywhere you can get the the foster book on animation learn how to do a walk but uh i like the stuff that tells stories about the studios and what it was work you know there's a good book on um total television have you got that one i don't think so let me write that one down uh I've, if i had it here it's upstairs but if i had it here it's um it's about everything that total television did you know what like tennessee mm -hmm. tuxedo underdog um, the Hunter, uh, you know, all of their shows from start to finish. Yeah. And that's pretty interesting. I like that. Um, the, the, you, you did an interview with this, the author of the Disney revolt, which I thought was a, was a, so was good. a good book. Oh, I like that book. Cause that's good. What, what I like about that book is it, it tells you a lot about Art Babbitt mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe he should be up on Mount Rushmore because I'll, I'll tell you what, not only was he a great animator, but if it wasn't for him, who knows when the, the we would have had the first animation guild started. Yeah. And uh, all those uh, artists, the nine old men who did not go out on strike, they all stood to gain from what he did for them mm -hmm. because they all got it covered by motion picture health and welfare and, and, not that they needed it, but they got pensions from that. And it, uh, he, he, he helped establish something that people that are in the industry today are enjoying. And so Art Babbitt is kind of a hero. And uh, that book is a good book. There's probably a lot of other books. I'd have to think about that more and try to see if I could, uh, you know, I have a lot of different books that are not necessarily great books there's mm -hmm. a really nice book that's uh uh miyazaki uh, uh yeah his work that's Beautiful. tons and tons of color stuff you know backgrounds and drawings and cells and stuff. that's a good book yes that's a really good book um i i enjoy reading about animation history more uh, more than i would uh, like reading about the process because i know the process i don't want to read about the process i want to read about the history I want to, and you know what's good? If you can find a book that tells you the truth as opposed to the, you know, glossed over truth, yeah. because in, in, for 
anybody that's out there watching this when you post it that doesn't work in animation or maybe they're fairly new to animation or maybe they're just a fan everybody and everything in animation is not as nice as you think mm -hmm. there there are people just like everybody else and some of them are nice and some of them are not so nice and and i know that because i work for some of the non the ones that were not so nice and uh so i like books that will tell you this is what really happened as opposed to like you know glossing over the history and go oh everything was wonderful and we all got along and everything was fun. bullshit that never happens <coughs> excuse me um sorry about that ladies and gentlemen uh so we rotate into the fans questions and uh i think the next time you're on we'll have to do another mount rushmore and then maybe we can do we can see uh who else you could put up there each time you got to come on we're going to do a new mount rushmore a new book recommendation okay. and i got to agree with you there man jake s friedman is the uh author for the disney revolt hands down like the moose that roared and the disney revolt I mean, I'm going back and rereading when Magoo flew. Those two you know, are favorites in anime. I, I will tell you something. It, it coincides with the Disney Revolt, and I might have mentioned this to you before and to any of your fans out there, people watching it. I tell this to people all the time, but most of them never follow up, and I don't know why. On YouTube, there's a video, and it's like a, a series of four videos, like mm -hmm. you know, chapter one, two, three, and four. It's called The Secret Life of Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. Watch that, because it's all about what led up to and during the strike and after the strike. And if you watch that, you will come away with going like, well, these people can't all be lying. Some of it's got, some yeah. of it's got to be true. Bill Hertz is in that. And he talks about what the strike was like. Bill Little John is almost everybody that's in that video are dead with maybe mm -hmm. the exception of the people that are like narrating and stuff. But they talk about, the way Disney started and what happened once they opened up in, in, in Burbank and the strike and what Disney tried to do to the strikers and what he did to the strikers after the strike was over. Watch that video. You'll find out that Uncle Walt wasn't so nice. Absolutely, man. Uh, and like I said, it's just those two books in particular are probably my favorite as far as historical pieces i'm going back and rereading um you know when magoo flew so that one's probably going to be tied as well um so we're going to go into the rotating the fans questions here um and here we go um having saved and preserved many things since the start of your career what would you say are the are your favorite finds that you still have did you ever come into possession of any master recordings of any certain shows, reel to reel, open reel, Umatic, Beta Cam, S, uh, Beta Cam SP, etc.? No, I don't have any uh, recordings. I mean, we, we, they used to. When I started, uh, well, when I first started, when I was doing assistant work, I didn't have to deal with any recordings. But eventually, when I started animating, you'd get your soundtrack on cassettes, and now that doesn't exist anymore because everything's done with an animatic so there's the soundtrack but i don't really i didn't keep any of that's that that sounds i have like a few i can see some down in the corner of a few cassettes and i don't even know what they're i have like i have this one cassette well it's behind my ipad here i have this one cassette that i kept because it's it's funny it's from a billy and mandy but it's an outtake and yeah. they played it at one of our all staff meetings mm -hmm. and it's something that was only done for put in for the all staff but was obviously not in the show it's the show where Billy's in the shower and he's been tricked into washing his hair with dog shit. So he's washing his hair and you see like the shout, the curtain, and he's like, washing my hair, washing my hair. And all of a sudden he goes, hey, this is dog shit. So that, <laughs> only, that only happened at the All Staff, but it wasn't in the show. So I, I kept that because it's funny. Uh, but I didn't keep the recordings. But as far as artwork goes, you know, I've got stuff. Um, I recently posted some drawings that I did from a, a piece of animation from 1970 that I, I, I kept this, the scene, which is the rough animation. And um, it was for a, a pilot that didn't s sell when George Sla Slatter did uh, called Wacky World. It was a, mm. he was trying to make an international laugh-in show. But I, you know, I have stuff, like I've got that sell from the Dalmatians and I bought at Disneyland in 1961 or two, whatever it was I got. And I, you know, I've got a lot of stuff that I like, you know, mm. that I've kept over the years and accumulated. And I'm a collector. It's animation art's not the only thing I've ever collected. I've collected other things over the years. And 
uh, I think it's just part of my DNA where it's like I get hooked on something and I go, well, I must collect this, you know, mm -hmm. and I do it for a while. But the animation art is one thing that I've accumulated over a longer stretch of years than anything else. And I like it. Absolutely, man. Um, what are your favorite memories of working at Cartoon Network Studios and who there did you have the most fun working with? Well, there's all kinds of memories. Um, I recently, I told this to Gendy recently that um, I enjoyed when we were doing Samurai Jack that we would do crew lunches where we would go to a restaurant as a crew mm -hmm. and all sit together and, and have lunch. That was fun. I hadn't done that in years. Um, I also enjoyed, you know, the things that would be going on at the studio. Like we'd have barbecues up in the summer up on the roof. Uh, yeah. and that was fun. The all staff meetings were always early on before the regime change were, were fun because they were at, we just go to this one restaurant in Burbank, which is fairly close to the studio and fun. And, and, you know, just talking and being with the people, that, the different artists was always nice, you know, but most of the time you're sitting at your desk in your office and you're doing your work unless you're a complete screw off and, and not doing your work. And, and a, the, there are those people that will take like extremely long lunches, come in late, go home early, and then they can't figure out why they're behind schedule. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I have a lot of good memories of working there. The last few, obviously the last few years, what, I haven't been at the studio since March of 2019 because the pandemic hit and they kicked us all out. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, it was good. It was fun. You know, I would, people would come into my office all the time and visit and talk. And um, I, I, I liked working there as just like I liked working to Hanna-Barbera. It was, it was good times. Absolutely, man. And uh, the next one here, what's your favorite memory working at Hanna-Barbera when it moved to the Imperial Bank building after they moved from? <laughs> that I was not. Yeah, I well, we it. Imperial Bank building was in Sherman Oaks. That's when Turner merged with Time Warner. Mm -hmm. And then so all of a sudden Warner's brothers became like Lord and Master. Yeah. And they decided they, they, they're going to sell the property at Hanna-Barbera was on, which is on which was dumb because we, I think we could have all, they could have moved Warner brothers there because there was plenty of room, but mm -hmm. they didn't. So they sold the property and we got moved into what was left of us. Uh, the Hanover Bear was in two locations. I was on the 14th floor of that Imperial bank building and Johnny Bravo and Powerpuff were down in what was called the garden building, which was like below a restaurant that, which is part of the mall that, there was a mall there and uh, I didn't, I, I didn't like working there because it was kind of Warner Brothers was in control. It wasn't the same as like working at Hanna-Barbera or even though I didn't have to answer to the Warner Brothers people, but it, and it was a pain in the ass to get to because it was the building, the, the, the location was one of the worst <coughs> trafficked places in the Valley, the corner of Sepulveda and, um, I don't remember, it was Sepulveda and Ventura Boulevard. Tons of traffic there every morning because of people just going to work on the west side and whatever. Mm -hmm. So the, you'd have to take the 405 freeway and it was always a pain in the ass going in and a pain in the ass going home. I really just, I didn't like it very much at all working there. Uh, the the show stuff was okay, but the location that I thought was lame. Yeah. But it, that, that was only for about three years and then we moved to Burbank. Yeah. Um, next one we got here, man. It's uh, what was something you first struggled with when you first started an animation? Um, and what did you do to snap out of that uh, as the problem? Does anything stick out when you first started animation that might have been difficult? Yeah, drawing. Drawing. Um, yeah, because I remember when I first started, I, you know, I had done stuff in school, at, you know, at, at Chenard and, you know, and amateur stuff but now i was doing it where you know you had to do it right and you know to get paid and it was not it wasn't something that i just was instantly great at so it was mm -hmm. a struggle 
And I can even remember one time, because the first thing I worked on was the cartoons that were in the show, the Banana Split show. And the mm -hmm. two cartoons were the Arabian Nights and the Three Musketeers. And I remember doing some in-betweens on the scene from the Arabian Nights where someone cuts the ropes to some tent and I think either a villain or a couple of villains are underneath the tent. And so the, the tent's like doing this. Today, that would be really easy for me if I had to do that. But doing it correctly so that the folds in the tent were right, I just found it hard. I remember taking that home to work at a, at home. So it was a <coughs> it was a struggle at first because you got to get used to following direction, you know, the, the timing charts and all that, and mm -hmm. you know, trying to draw the characters properly. It, it was not easy for me, and uh, it was a struggle. But you know, I got, slowly got better and better and quicker at it. But it, just drawing was 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 tough at first do you ever go back and look at some of the stuff you did in your early in your career only if i'm by accident yeah uh, and the way i would find it like uh, maybe on youtube if i think to type out uh, look at it or sometimes on um boomerang used to run some old hand over stuff and if it, if something was on that i know i worked on mm -hmm. i might stop and look at it to see if it, i can remember it and sometimes something would come on and I only reason I know I worked on it because I'd see the end credits and my name is on it. I go, well, I guess I worked on that. But uh, occasionally, it, yeah, it, it's always kind of weird looking at stuff that we, we worked on in the 70s and even into the early 80s, because in my opinion, it always looks bad. Yeah. But nowadays, I don't really go and look to see if I can find stuff that I worked on it because it that doesn't interest me with uh do you, do you remember the first i'm trying to word this where i don't sound like a dick do you remember the first big Hanna barbera project you worked on as far as show goes well yeah the very first thing was the banana split show because that was my first job that was and your first so job. to me that was big because yeah. i had never i hadn't done anything in the industry before so that was the first that was big to me and mm -hmm. then after that, it was just the, the following year I worked on the, the Harlem Globetrotter show. Yeah. And uh, no, wait, the following year I worked on the Perils of Penelope Pit Stop, mm -hmm. which for me was tough at times. And then the following year I worked on Harlem Globetrotters. And, you know, and then it was a series of working on, you know, doing assistant work on Hanna Barbera shows, which I've long since forgotten. Yeah. And, you know, they were all the same to me, basically. But, but I, I I can't recall anything that was really super big, other than the fact that in 1968, I was in the right place at the right time, and I got to work on Yellow Sub. Yeah. And that was fun, only because it was, I'm, a bit, I'm a Beatle fan, and mm -hmm. here I'm working on this Beatle film, and that was great. The only reason I bring up the, the Hanna-Barbera thing is because, um, were you ever a wrestling fan, like WWF, WWE thing back in the day? Well, n not really of them, but I liked wrestling when I was very, like my, like 12 and 13. And mm -hmm. I, I think I've told you this before, locally, you know, and all the, the markets had their own local wrestling. Yeah. Thing. And I, out in California, Los Angeles, they had wrestling that was on one of the, the local stations once a week. And it was from the Olympic Auditorium. And that's, they used to have like Freddie Blassie yeah. and Mr. Moto and, you know, and I don't know, you know the destroyer who was a guy that wore a mask and when you're that young and back then especially back then you you don't realize it was all fake mm -hmm. but you watched it because it was it was fun but i <coughs> i soon lost interest in it but then when it got into the 80s i actually on a, worked on the deke show the the whole Hogan show that deke did which yeah. was freelance for me but it was and it was lame let's be honest it wasn't very good but to me it was just another freelance job but i i don't i don't have like an interest at all now in, in wrestling well the only reason i bring that up is because you can draw that in a correlation to animation and here's why so in wrestling everybody's goal and this is all you've ever heard from i haven't watched it in years it just i, I just couldn't get into it anymore but uh 
you know, when you sit back and you watch it, it's like everybody's goal was to get to WWF at the time. Vince McMahon, they had the biggest thing. They had Hogan, they had Andre the Giant, they had all of them. And in animation, you know, it, the goal was for most people was Disney was like the WWF of animation. Everybody's every road led to Disney because of the history, because of the prestige of working for Disney. Now, with TV animation at that time when you broke into the industry, were people really striving to get to Hanna Barbera? Because, like when I said it, when I growing up, Hanna Barbera before Cartoon Network started, that was that was the only game in town for me. But was it like that in the industry? Everybody wanted to get to Hanna. Yeah, I, I think so. It was like one of the the, the big studios to to work for. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, there were others that had started up sh shortly thereafter. Yeah, but Hanna Barbera was was a big one. You know, Filmation was big for a while, and and I guess people were drawn to to want to work there. Mm -hmm. I did. I worked for a couple of seasons for Filmation because you know it was the job, and I never liked any of the stuff I worked on. I didn't I didn't care for the studio uh, or the way it was run. Yeah, but Hanna Barbera was a big was a big one. Ruby Spears was big for a while, but I think there were a number of people that wanted to work at Hanna Barbera in television. Um, I just this the very first stuff I worked on was Hanna Barbera, and then yeah. continued to work on, and then eventually went on staff. So, absolutely, it was just right place at the right time. Yeah, they had such a catalog of not they did they they have such a catalog of characters that are just. Man, they like they said they invade my consciousness on a regular basis. You know, from Huckleberry Hound to Snagglepuss to McGilla Gorilla is one of my favorites. Frankenstein Junior is one of my favorite shows, and it gets it gets shit on because it's not like it's the greatest show in the world, but it's by far not the worst show in the world. There's just something fun about those characters because a lot of these shows that I grew up with were in between watching things like the A Team, um, you know, in the heat of the night um my grandpa i would watch everything with when it was come to movies and stuff he was like a really big movie guy he loved movies queen of the nile he would tell you everything about the movie he'd tell you everything about the actress he would tell you everything about the production and then when grandpa would fall asleep i'd switch it onto cartoons and then he was such a cool dude he would wake up he'd watch some cartoons with me and then we'd flip it back to turner classic movies so my my love of like old school whether it's movies films cartoons what have you came from him a lot of it because he would just sit there and watch and he would tell you facts. And this is back before you could like fact check anything. So anything grandpa said to me, I had to treat it like the gospel. I had to treat it like he knew. I was like, God damn, this guy knows everything out here. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I just, like I said, I, I look back on that industry and that, that, uh, that studio so fondly. Um, we got another one here. So I said, when it comes to Samurai Jack, what is the most challenging thing you ever had to do, uh, do while working with Gendy on that show? Anything stick out as the most challenging for Jack? Well, uh, I wouldn't say it was the most challenging, but probably the the big challenge was getting it right. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, Gendy checked uh, every storyboard that uh, I was one of the directors and Rob Renzetti was for a while and Randy Myers, and he would check all of the boards. And if he didn't like what you did, he would change it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, trying to get it right and, do it the way you think he would want you to do it was the biggest challenge but it was uh, yeah i i always i i don't look back at that time thinking like uh, i was not worried i was i felt comfortable working on it once i started mm -hmm. i came off of working on powerpuff girls and he had already started samurai jack so when i came on to samurai jack it was established as in the first season what he wanted and all that mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, grasping the way things are done. And there would be times where I might go into his room and ask him some questions. And, uh, but he has a way of making you feel comfortable because he's he's actually a very nice person mm -hmm. and easy to work for. As long as you don't goof off and you do your work and you get it done on time and you do good work, he's easy to work for. And so I got along with him fine. And, um, I don't recall being challenged to the point where I had a difficult time at all working for him. Yeah. Um, and then this one's one of those, uh, I usually don't ask these, but I thought it was fascinating. Um, he said, I've heard that Robert Alvarez is also the uncle-in-law of actress, voice actress, Isabella Alvarez, the voice of Ronnie Ann from the loud house and the yeah. Casa Grandes. Yeah. Um, any weight behind that or no? 
Now, here's the problem. IMDb is like um, a frustrating experience. I have tried to get them to change. I They eventually, I think they eventually changed that because I, you know, there's a thing where you can edit yeah. on IMDb. Mm -hmm. And I think I got them to drop that. But now if you look at it, they have me being married to Sherry Stoner or something like that. Some lady, you know, I, I gave up trying to have them change it. I must have sent you know done the, the routine of sending them the information to delete that at least 20 times and it's mm -hmm. probably still there but imdb is not accurate it, it like well, there's like that personal information about me like they had me being the uncle of someone that i didn't even know who the hell she was yeah. and then they had me being married to this lady that i'd never even met and uh so th and then on top of that IMDb also has, at least on mine, and I'm sure they do this with other people, they have things on there that I've never even worked on. Yeah. And I don't know how they get, how it gets that way, but they, there's probably at least four or five things that I, if I went down the list to go, I did not work on that, did not work on that. And it's, I don't know how they get so screwed up, but it's not entirely accurate. Come so on, I'm not I'm not that lady's uncle. I don't know who the hell she is, and if and if she's related to me, which she's not, but if she is, it would be nice if she sent me a birthday card with some cash in it once in a while. <laughs> and that uh, and Sherry, the, the 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 person I'm supposedly married to, um, she should throw some money my way as well because she's obviously very successful, and I'm semi-retired now, so I could use the money. So Sherry, come on. Send, send your husband some money, please. Come on, Sherry, do better. Isabella, do yeah. better. Yeah, um, don't, don't make me come after you. <laughs> All right, so I figured we could end it with the, uh, these last two. And this one I've started doing uh, recently because I, I find it pretty fun. And I actually started this one with Toby Jones. Uh, you know, he had some very kind things to say about you as well. Uh, one of my favorite people that I've had on recently, too, because getting to know that he was a super fan of regular show to working on regular show, I just thought it was fascinating. Um, but, uh, so I started this one with him and so you get five people, five dinner guests dead or alive that you get to invite to dinner. You have oh. to make the food as well. So who are oh, you shit. inviting? What are you cooking? And what are you guys going to talk about? Well, first off with cooking, I, I don't cook. I'm not like you, I'm not a chef. <laughs> so I would, have, I would, have, you know, I guess I could have my wife there so that she mm -hmm. can actually do the cooking. I can bullshit that they told me I made it so <laughs> I would have her make pasta you know I like I like her pasta and her sauce that she makes and, and mm -hmm. people so I'd do that now people that would be an interesting yeah a really interesting thing because historically I would want some people from the past mm -hmm. not just animation people it, it, well you anybody know what would be fun there. yeah anybody it would there. be fun it'd be like Walt Disney just so okay. I could grill him about a bunch of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. you know, poke him with the stick. Yeah. Uh, but then famous other famous people uh, would be, you know, um, gosh, that's a tough one because I can go down a list and think of tons of historical people that would be, you know, what would be interesting. This is going to throw everyone for a loop. Christ. And you know yeah. why? Why? Because I want to ask him, like, come on. I know what really happened when they wrote the Bible and stuff, because it wasn't written when you were even on the planet. It's I recently saw a post about how it was revised, revised, rewritten, revised, rewritten over the countless hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, like, OK, let's let's get some stuff straight here. Did you actually walk on water or is that bullshit? Did you uh, did you make all that food from the for those people who the Sermon on the Mount and all stuff, or is that, or is that like, you know, a lot of bullshit or was somebody really catering? And who picked up the tab for the last dinner? You know, what, who was it? Was it Judas? Because he had money. So like, and uh, it would be fun talking to him. He probably would be pissed off at me, but it would be fun. I think Walt would be uh, pissed off too. So you got two people already mad at this dinner party. Robert, who else yeah. you got? You got Walt and Christ. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then, you know, it might be fun to speak to some other historical people. Um, yeah, I mean, this is going to throw people for a loop too. It's like Churchill. Okay. Churchill might be fun to talk to because, you know, get get some booze into him because he, he did drink. 
Oh, and boy, then get yeah. them to loosen up and tell stories. That might be fun. And, you know, I'll give you a good one. Orson Welles. Ooh. <laughs> Orson Welles. He is fascinating. Mm -hmm. If you see, there's tons of interviews on YouTube with him on various shows. Orson Welles. And maybe some other directors from the Golden Age or Vintage Hollywood. Uh, that's, I got Churchill, Christ, Disney, Wales. I got one more. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one. Bogart. Yeah. <laughs> Bogart, Bogart is my favorite actor. So I would have him. And um, I could... I'll think of tons of things to ask him about, you know, working in Hollywood and all that and what was really going on. Um, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd piss off Bogart and I, and I wouldn't piss off Wells. I, well, maybe so. I, I have a friend who's a cameraman. Mm -hmm. And when he was very young, he worked on that film that Wells actually never completed one of his last films. And he was working on it with wells and he said he wanted to ask Wells something and he said orson what do you and wells got really pissed at him because this guy called my friend called him orson and he you know it wasn't like they were equals or anything so who knows what he would be like but um i don't know you know maybe i'd have a sign over the door before anybody entered saying leave your egos outside and um just come in sit your ass down and be prepared for questions Oh, man, I hope to be a fly on the wall if that dinner party ever happens, Robert, because boy, oh, boy, would that be an interesting take, man. Um, and uh, the last one here, uh, it, it's we're going to kind of revisit that first question I asked you when we started, man. But uh, we're going to we're going to summarize it here just a little bit. If you could summarize your entire experience in the animation field into one word, one sentence, one phrase, I don't know, man, one paragraph, man, what would it be? What would Robert Alvarez say at the end of the day? Once those lights flip off for his animation studio for the last time, man, what would you sum it up as? He was very lucky. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because um, I don't think I'm any great artist by any stretch of the imagination. I, I would consider myself as a TV adequate animator when I was doing animation. But I enjoyed working in the business because that's something I wanted to do from when I was in the seventh grade. And um, I was lucky in a lot of times over the course of my career, just working in the right place at the right time and meeting the, the, the very talented people that I've worked with over the years. And um, like I said, I, just very lucky and uh, I, I, I'm glad that I had the career that I that I finally had, and um, it's it's been a a long road. It probably went a bit too fast, in the sense that if things weren't the way they were now, I probably would still be working like full time, but that's just didn't happen because of. Thank you, Discovery Channel, you pricks. <laughs> and um, uh, I, like I said, I'm just, I consider myself very lucky that I had the career that I had and that I worked fairly consistently. And um, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's here's the thing about anybody that does anything in animation, film, or whatever it is. It's left up to the historians that'll follow and years later or, or critics or whatever you want to call them as to what they think I accomplished or what they think of me. Because I'm not one of those guys that's going to, and you know me, I'm not going to sit there and go like, well, oh, hey, I'm so talented. You know, they couldn't have started the shows without me. That's not me. And so, um, it's up to someone else to come along and say, and of course it'll be their opinion, especially if they say something bad about me, but they, it'll be up to some historian down the road or somebody that's putting a footnote in a book and they're talking about me as to what they think I accomplished. But I, I did a lot. 
I worked on a lot of stuff and I worked on a lot of good shows. I also worked on a lot of bad shows and I had a good time working in the business, even though it's technically not over. It won't be over until after July. And um, I'll tell you one little, real quick story that happened to me early on. This was about say 1971 mm -hmm. and um i was doing assistant work at the time and i would take home freelance work on the weekends to make extra money because my paycheck i think then was like 125 dollars a week mm -hmm. which was not a, a lot of money in those days so if i did freelance work for the same company on weekends if i could take a lot of assistant work home I could maybe make another hundred and twenty-five dollars, you know, which was pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. So I was working. I, I a lot of times I would work like all day Saturday, and then I'd work Sunday. And I was sitting at my desk, and it's like four in the morning on Monday morning. And I'm still doing assistant work, and I was so punch drunk by that point. I'm looking at the drawings on on the disc. And the characters are starting to like move without me doing anything. It's like <laughs> I was really out of it. And I went, oh, that's it. Pencils down. And I went to, got up and went to bed for a couple hours and got up, and, you know, got to work for, at the, the office I was working at at nine o'clock. But I was dedicated. Mm -hmm. And to be successful in animation, you have to have some talent, dedication, discipline, and luck. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had those. Beautiful, man. Well, if I've gotten anything from what you just said, man, that luck, very lucky that Fred Seibert stumbled out your name when he was talking about his uh, his early days at being at Hanna-Barbera when he took over. Very lucky that you answered my message to come on my show a couple years ago. I'm very lucky that you never told me to fuck off, leave me alone. I'm tired of your dumbass questions, man. And I'm very lucky that, like I said, over these last couple years, I've gotten to pick your brain and see from a different perspective on some of the greatest things that I've ever watched in my life. If there's been one constant in my life through animation, just being a fan, uh, it's been your name among many greats, man. Uh, I think you mentioned it that, you know, you weren't, uh, you weren't anything special on the first episode. You were just a mechanic. You were doing your job. You were the guy that was there day in, day out that everybody could count on. And through all the people that I've had interactions with on this show that have had a direct line to you, they've all said the same thing. There's nobody better than Robert. There was nobody that accepted us more with open arms. There were so many people that were the veterans of the industry that turned their backs on them when they came in and you ushered in a new era and a new generation with open arms and you really helped mold and shape these young men and women into giving us the greatest cartoons, in my opinion, ever made. Um, you know, I, I told you when you were on the last time, man, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done. Uh, you know, animation fans of animation owe you a very, very, very deep gratitude for, for going for as long as you have and doing everything you've done. Um, and like I said, man, I really appreciate our chats and I really appreciate our talks, man. But, uh, he's been Robert. I've been Julian. This has been a what's my head podcast. And this has been another piece and a huge piece of your childhood. Good night.